Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the daily quiz for today. But today being a Sunday, let's take up a set of 10 questions from a static subject. And this week, we shall focus on environment and ecology. Because this is a very important subject for your prelims, considering the number of questions that appear in the exam. So let's get started with the daily quiz for today by looking at the first question. Consider the following statements with regard to biosphere. Biosphere includes both biotic and abiotic components that are present in the lithosphere, hydrosphere and the atmosphere. In a biosphere, there are established pathways for movement of energy and matter. Both the statements are correct. Option C is the right answer. See, in order to answer such static questions, you need to know the definition and the concept of biosphere. See, the biosphere is a global ecosystem that is made up of both biotic and abiotic components. The biotic components include all the living beings such as plants, animals, birds and aquatic animals. And the abiotic components include soil, air, water and nutrients which are found in the lithosphere, the hydrosphere and the atmosphere. And within this biosphere, there are established pathways such as food chains and biogeochemical cycles through which energy and matter are moving throughout the biosphere. Now let's take up the second question. Which of the following are correctly matched? Earthworm, scavenger, vulture, decomposer, fungi, detrivo. All the three are incorrectly matched. So option D is the right answer. See, the earthworm is essentially a detrivore, whereas vulture is a scavenger and fungi is a decomposer. To understand this, let's look at a food chain. See, in any food chain, the biotic components can be divided into the following categories. First, we have the producers or the autotrophs that produce their own energy, such as trees, grass, plants, etc. Then we have the heterotrophs that consume the energy produced by the autotrophs. And first, we have primary consumers that is the herbivores, such as a rabbit, zebra, etc. These primary consumers are in turn consumed by secondary and tertiary consumers who are at the top of the food chain, such as a lion, a cheetah, and other carnivores and omnivores. Then you have a scavenger, which is essentially an opportunistic animal or a bird that feeds on dead carcasses and dead animal matter. For example, vulture is a scavenger. Even a hyena can be regarded as a scavenger in some cases. Then we have detrivores. Detrivores are those organisms which feed on detritus. Detritus is nothing but dead organic matter which includes plant matter, animal matter and even animal feces. So such detritus is directly consumed by a few heterotrophs and they are known as detritivores or detrivores. Examples of detrivores include the earthworm, the dung rolling beetle, etc. Then finally, we have decomposers such as bacteria and fungi, which decompose and break down dead organic matter into inorganic nutrients and return them back to the abiotic world through their enzymatic action. Now let's look at the third question. In a given ecosystem, a flowering plant is being consumed by a caterpillar which in turn is being eaten by a frog. The frog is preyed upon by a snake, which in turn is consumed by a higher predator such as an eagle. What type of a food chain does this feeding pattern represent? The correct answer is option B. It is a grazing type of food chain. See, to answer this question, you need to know about the two types of food chains that exist. Food chains are primarily divided into grazing type of food chain and detritus type of food chain. If a particular food chain begins with an autotroph, such as a plant, then such a food chain is known as a grazing type of food chain. This plant in turn will be consumed by primary consumers, such as herbivores, and they would be later consumed by secondary and tertiary predators, which could include carnivores and omnivores. Whereas, if a particular food chain begins with detritus, that is dead organic matter, then such a food chain is known as a detritus food chain. In this case, the dead organic matter 
is being eaten by a directed to war which in turn are consumed by the higher consumers now let's take up the fourth question which of the following functions of a black bear can be categorized as its ecological niche feeds on nuts fruits insects and small animals blood feeding parasites feed on it helps disperse seeds of berries over long distances and helps in propagation all the three are correct option d is the right answer again to answer such a static question you need to know the definition and the concept of ecological niche see the term niche refers to specialization so ecological niche is nothing but the functional position of an organism or a species in its given environment see every organism performs a certain function in the ecosystem and it not only takes something from the environment but it also gives back something to the environment because every organism or every species resides in a particular habitat it has a particular interaction with other organisms and even with the abiotic components it also has a particular behavior pattern through which it is interacting with the plants with other higher consumers and as well as with the overall ecosystem so during this entire course of interaction in a given habitat the organism takes some resources from the habitat and also contributes something back to the habitat so eventually it's not just the ecosystem which is shaping the organism but even the organisms are shaping their ecosystem so this specialized role and function performed by a species or an organism is known as its ecological niche so if you consider the example of a american black bear then you can find them in dense forested areas of north america they are omnivores and hence they feed on nuts berries insects and small animals they even play host to a number of blood sucking parasites and insects that reside in their coat and since they feed on nuts and berries they usually swallow the seeds as well and they tend to carry them in their digestive systems over long distances and eventually expel them through excretion thus allowing the propagation of the seeds so similarly for every organism its ecological niche can be listed out and once you understand the concept of ecological niche it would be easier to point out the niche areas or the functions of any given organism now let's look at the fifth question which of the following is not a biomagnifier mercury cyanide cadmium hydrogen the correct answer is option d hydrogen it's not a biomagnifier the other three are biomagnifiers to answer this question you need to understand what is biomagnification and bioaccumulation see first let's talk about biomagnification biomagnification is also referred to as bioamplification it is nothing but the increasing concentration of a particular toxin in the tissue of organisms as you move up the food chain there are certain toxic substances that we refer to as biomagnifiers whose concentration level increases in organisms as you move up the food chain examples of biomagnifiers include heavy metals such as mercury cadmium etc toxic substances such as cyanide pesticides such as ddt and pcbs or polychlorinated biphenyls which is a byproduct of industrial waste see when such biomagnifiers enter the water bodies they are consumed initially in small quantities by the phytoplanktons and then later by the zooplanktons these planktons in turn are consumed by the small fish and as they consume them in larger quantities over a considerable period of time the toxic substance starts accumulating within each organism of that species that is at that trophic level in the food chain and we refer to this as bioaccumulation so if biomagnification is the vertical increase in concentration of biomagnifiers within a food chain then bioaccumulation is the horizontal increase of the toxic biomagnifier within a particular organism at a particular given trophic level in the food chain so later when the medium sized fishes consume the smaller fishes over a long period of time they will end up with a higher concentration of the biomagnifier thereby resulting in biomagnification 
or bio amplification as you move up the food chain so as a result the apex predators they report the highest concentration levels of the bio magnifiers thereby poisoning the entire food chain so even human beings when they consume such organisms they end up becoming the victims of bio magnification and poisoning now let's take up a related topic under the sixth question which of the following are the direct consequences of mercury poisoning neuromuscular weakness serious birth defects kidney dysfunction all the three are correct option d is the right answer see mercury being a bio magnifier and a toxic heavy metal it is extremely hazardous for all organisms including humans who come at the very top of the food chain mercury is released into the environment through both natural sources and as well as through anthropogenic sources natural sources such as volcanoes release some quantities of mercury into the atmosphere and the environment but most of the toxic mercury that is found in the environment is because of industrial processes the gold industry coal and steel industry and as well as the medical industry they all contribute to the release of mercury into the environment which eventually enters the food chain contaminating all the organisms and when humans consume them they end up becoming the victims of bio magnification and mercury poisoning mercury is extremely hazardous to human beings as it severely affects several organs and functions including the nervous system the lungs kidneys the skin and the fetus development as well mercury poisoning is known to cause several diseases such as pink disease which primarily affects the skin and the hair and as well as the minamata disease and it's known to have a severe impact on neuromuscular functioning even leading to muscle weakness it even affects the motor functions and motor abilities and even leads to deformities in infants as it affects the development of the fetus in pregnant women it even leads to failure and dysfunction of several organs including the kidney the liver heart and lungs and hence mercury poisoning is one of the most serious cases of environmental disasters now let's look at the seventh question consider the following statements with regard to bio geochemical cycles the flow of energy in ecosystems is unidirectional oxygen carbon hydrogen and nitrogen are needed in small quantities to sustain life and hence they are known as micronutrients the chemicals are sometimes held for long periods of time in one place and it is called a reservoir pool amongst the given statements the second statement is incorrect so option d is the right answer see in our ecosystem there are various chemicals and nutrients that are essential for all life forms to exist nutrients such as oxygen carbon nitrogen hydrogen phosphorus they are all needed in large quantities and hence they are known as macronutrients these nutrients they keep circulating in our ecosystem by passing through both the biotic world and the abiotic world that is they pass through the food chains and as well as through the atmosphere hydrosphere and the lithosphere and since they circulate through the biological world and as well as through the geological world they are referred to as bio geochemical cycles their movement in the ecosystem is referred to as a cycle because they circulate within the ecosystem unlike the unidirectional flow of energy in the ecosystem if you look at this pyramid of energy it becomes very clear that energy flows in a single direction in a food chain whereas all the essential nutrients they circulate within the ecosystem thereby forming the bio geochemical cycles as you can see in this pyramid of energy at each trophic level in the food chain the energy is getting lost as you move up the food chain that's because at each trophic level energy is getting transformed into heat because of the regular activities of the organisms as you move up the food chain there is a loss of energy and hence the flow of energy in a ecosystem is unidirectional whereas the nutrients circulate in the ecosystem through bio geochemical cycles and hence we have different cycles such as the carbon cycle the oxygen cycle nitrogen and phosphorus cycle and when these nutrients are held in a particular place for a long time we refer to that place as a reservoir pool usually it is the atmosphere or the lithosphere for example carbon stays in the atmosphere for a long period of time 
and it could also be locked up in the lithosphere for a very long period of time. So such long stable pools of the nutrient, they are referred to as the reservoir pools. Whereas when they are circulating through the biotic world, that is through the food chain, we refer to this area or this region as the exchange pool where the nutrients are getting exchanged. Now let's look at the eighth question. Geological process called the uplift plays a major role in which of the following biogeochemical cycles? The correct answer is option B in the phosphorus cycle. See, the primary reservoir pool for phosphorus is the sediments of the earth. Phosphorus is an essential nutrient for plant growth and as well as for other animals. And the plants draw phosphorus from the sediments of the earth. Phosphorus is also released naturally through volcanoes as well. But the problem with phosphorus is that it is highly water soluble. So as a result, the phosphorus deposits, they easily get leached and they eventually drain into the water bodies, that is the lakes and the rivers, and finally drain into the seas and the oceans. Here, the phosphorus sediments get deposited as ocean sediments. So as a result, a large part of phosphorus gets lost away for a long period of time. And hence, usually soils are deficient in phosphorus. But humans have carried out a major disruption to the phosphorus cycle because to improve the productivity of soil, phosphorus has been mined and turned into fertilizer. And as a result, anthropogenic activities such as agriculture has caused a long-term disruption to the phosphorus cycle. So eventually, for these oceanic phosphorus sediments to get deposited on Earth again, we require a geological process known as uplift or uplifting. And through this, the ocean sediments eventually get deposited as earth sediments. Now let's look at the ninth question. Consider the following statements with regard to ecological succession. Ecological succession is the process of change in the species structure of an ecological community over time. It leads to a stable self-perpetuating community called the serial stage. Secondary succession is faster than primary succession. Amongst the given statements, the second statement is incorrect. So option D is the right answer. See, as the first statement says, ecological succession is the changes that occur in the structure of the species of an ecological community over a period of time. An ecological community, which is initially barren, will eventually become a stable, self-perpetuating community through the constant interaction between the biotic and the abiotic elements. So this long-term succession in the species structure of an ecological community is known as ecological succession. Each stage in this succession is known as a serial stage. So this obviously makes the second statement incorrect because the self-perpetuating stable community at the end is referred to as the climax stage or the climax community. And serial stage refers to each of the succession stages in the entire process. This ecological succession can be of two types, primary and secondary. In primary succession, the succession begins with a barren piece of land, which gradually evolves to give birth to higher species, such as small lichens, then maybe plants and grass, then eventually shrubs, and finally a stable tree community. But such an ecological community undergoing primary succession could be hit by a disaster in between, such as a forest fire, and after this disaster, the succession has to start over. But this time, the succession doesn't begin from a barren piece of land. Instead, it begins from an intermediate stage. And as a result, secondary succession is always much faster than primary succession. Then coming to the last question, biotic potential of a species is determined by reproductive span of the species, frequency of reproduction, the size of the litter, survival rate. All the four are correct. So option D is the right answer. See, biotic potential is nothing but the maximum reproductive capacity of a particular organism in ideal environmental conditions. This is a measure used by ecologists to understand the strength of an organism in an ecosystem. And this maximum reproductive capacity of the organism under ideal environmental conditions is based on four key factors. This includes the total reproductive span of the species, the frequency of their reproduction, the size of the litter and the survival rate of the litter. So with this, let's conclude our discussion for today. Thanks for watching.